Try to double it. Hold it! <laughs> <laughs> What do you, how do you feel after that one? Like a 231 training for Ron Ashell. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a pretty good 231 deadlift. <laughs> I mean... Actually, maybe even 205. 205? I know pull, 205 so you can pull more than that. I think Ian Bell could do that for 10. <laughs> Off blocks, he could do it for 20. Yeah, at least I made it. <laughs> Ship training, um, like same thing I was doing last week, except just different stuff. High volume squats, I did 6x6 six six with 210 kilos. Doesn't seem like a lot, but it's you know uh, 16,500 pounds of volume in work sets, and I, I'm gonna do that four times this week with different weights. This is actually the lightest day. Later in the week, I'll be doing 5D1 for 10 triples or 250 keys. So that's pretty good. Um, then after that, I'm gonna move into more high intent, high higher intensity squats, and and probably raise, put the volume up on my deadlifts and do some lighter weights probably will see me struggle with like a 340 kilo block pull. Um, deadlift was going good a couple weeks ago and I feel like just the squats four times a week maybe just really killing my hamstrings but honestly I don't know what my PR is off those blocks raw because I've never pulled raw block pulls. I was just trying to mix it up a little bit today and, and do some heavy weight because I know that next week I'm probably going to do more volume instead of heavy weight so that's my idea. Work. Work, I worked out, I guess. It's not a bad pull. You know, I'm still about 13 weeks out of Worlds, and I'll, I'll get a good peak, and that will be an easy weight off the floor raw uh, soon, and I'll pull him in a suit and pull that for a triple. So, <laughs> uh, What's up? so this is where I work. Uh, i got a couple guys here. Um, it's Friday, so not everybody's here. Wearing shorts. Massachusetts summer, so trying to relax a little bit. A little plot room we have. We've got a printer for plans, stuff like that. Always drawing plans, site plans, that's what we do here mostly. Civil engineering, utility plans. Um, actually, we're going out on the roof because one of the reasons we moved to this office is because one of our biggest projects is actually right next door. So uh, we're on the roof now. Like I said, one of our biggest projects is right next door. That's a big reason that we're out here. Apartment building. Um, and over there where you see those concrete foundations, that's going to be like a 15-story apartment building with an uh, underground parking garage. Um, we did a lot of the grading, drainage, stormwater permitting, um, utility connections, uh, landscape design, stuff like that. We do site and utility design to support the architects who design these with what hopefully will be beautiful buildings here in Quincy Center. So. Uh, that's a pretty good idea of where I'm at every day and get a cool look at one of our projects. So uh, after this, we're gonna head to the gym and do some more training. So I'm in the middle of some training. It's really hot and humid in Massachusetts in the summer. So I'm dying in here, but people are starting to show up to the workout. And we have this great facility here, so people come from far and wide. So we're just gonna go see who's here and see how long they took to get here. Hey, go. Al Roth. Al Roth. Come here. So, Sunday bench at Bay State. Yes, sir. A little squat, too, but how long did you drive to get here? Uh, three hours. Three hours. Where do you live? Connecticut. Connecticut. Every Sunday, Al Roth here. Why do you, why do you drive three hours to train here? I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. No good reason. Uh, these guys, I'm new to gear, so they've, they've helped me. We help they've, you? They've gotten me into gear, sorry. Oh, <laughs> they've gotten me into yeah, gear. Yeah, we don't help anybody. Oh, look who's here. Oh, it's us. Luis. What's going Coach on? Coach Lou. Nice hair. What'd you do to your hair this morning? I just messed it, I didn't <laughs> messed it all up. Yeah, Lou. I just left it like that. What's How up? long do you typically drive to get to Bay State? Dude, the Bay State? About an hour, hour 15 minutes. All right. That's all right. enough. Yeah. Where do you live? Rosendale. Rosendale, Mass. Yeah, it's part of Boston. Why do you drive down there? What's the point? Why? You can just go to Workout World in Rosendale. Ah, man. The environment here, you know? These people <laughs> here. It's, it's something else. Something it's else. Something magical right. about Bay Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. Who is it? What's your, what's your first name? Peach. Peach. <laughs> Peach. <laughs> Peach, where do you live? I live in Somerset. Somerset, Mass. Mass. Okay. Yeah. Basically, like, Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Basically. How long do you typically... It's, actually, it's actually more... An hour and ten. 
on a great day. Great day. Somerset is further <laughs> south than Rhode Island. It is. So, it is. Yeah. why do you drive an hour ten <laughs> yeah, it is. to come to Bay State? Because <laughs> it's the best gym in the country. Period. Best gym in the oh, best. I said best gym in Northeast. Yeah. We got best gym great in the country. Answer. It is the best gym in the country. All right, one, one more. One more. Oh, oh, right now. oh. <laughs> one more. This is Steve King. He lives in a cave. Yeah. <laughs> he actually. You only. You take like five minutes to get here. You live in the swamp out back. Oh, <laughs> you know, it takes me like 15 minutes to get ready first, and then you gotta crawl out of the swamp. It's kind of hard. And why do you crawl out of the swamp to come to Bay State? Because it's, like you said, the best gym in the world. world. <laughs> in the world. <laughs> you gotta... All right, we just finished up training. We're here at Riva Pizzeria in Situate. Pretty much come here every Sunday after we train for like four or five hours. You know, what, what are the CrossFitters called? A refeed? <laughs> That's what we do here. So, losing a salad, but Peach, 183, he's eating the whole pizza. And uh, I'm gonna share a slice or two with my old lady. So, uh, I'm gonna eat like six or seven of those. She's gonna have one. We'll see how she feels. The dog, Lola, might get some scraps. I told you Lola know. I'd give her a piece. We might have to get another pizza. So, depending how this one goes. Yeah, this is uh, basically every Sunday, so that's it. Talk about how I. I guess manage my social life with uh, lifting. Um, I guess you'll see it a lot through these videos that most of my social life is in the gym. I'm here with Peach right now. King's filming. These guys are always here. If I have a meet, they're helping me out. If they have a meet, you know, we're, we're always helping each other out. We'll go eat, we'll mess around, you know, we'll barbecue sometimes on the weekends. Me and King will go to the beach, look like a couple beach whales. So. I mean, it's easy to manage my social life because most of it is in the gym. Like, we, we have a lot of fun in here. You'll see that in the videos. Um, it's definitely a relaxed training environment. Not too serious unless, you know, you're really close to a meet. Everybody kind of changes their attitude and gets serious. But, I mean, I, to manage my social life, like, my family lives four hours away. And, and I do do some stuff on the weekends. You know, I'm 27 years old. All my friends are getting married and all this stuff going on and bachelor parties. Like... You have to be flexible. I'll train two, three days in a row in the week so I can leave for the weekend. Or if I go down to New York to visit my parents, I'll, I'll train in a commercial gym. I always make sure I get my training in. You know, sometimes running around, you know, maybe have a couple adult beverages. You don't feel great, but over the years, I feel like it's better to go and do something than nothing at all. And I mean, I don't really train that heavy, so it's easy. <laughs> I see what the IPF does, and I, you know, I, I came from an athletic background. Um, I liked USAPL meets because it, 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 you feel like an athlete, you feel like you're at a real event, but you realize that a lot of you have to be athletic to lift in the IPF. You have to be able to squat to depth. You have to be good at all three lifts. You know, you, you have to be just well-rounded. You have to keep a certain level of athleticism and flexibility, and be strong. And I think like. You know, people strive to be more athletic in the USAPL, so I like that, or IPF. And also the competition is just crazy deep. You know, I, I competed at IPF Worlds in 2013 in Norway, and I mean, there were like four guys in the fight who squat a thousand pounds. And this is, I mean, drug free and, and to depth and probably really deep, you know. Um, you just don't see that anywhere else, and I mean, that stuff's just crazy. and. Hopefully one day I'll be in the mix like that, and maybe sooner than later. I know the competition this year at Worlds is probably going to be even deeper than that. It might be like six guys squatting over a thousand, a um, bunch of guys benching over eight hundred. It, it's just you know that's that's what I'm here for. I'm here for competition. I want a medal at IPF Worlds. <laughs> that's just my main goal. Um, so that's really why I stick with the IPF, and that kind of relates to the social life thing and. One tip that is good to keep your social life in order is to do, like, don't do extra meets. Like, don't go chasing records. Like, so the last couple of years, I think I've just done, like, the minimum nationals to try and qualify for Worlds, and then you do Worlds. Um, luckily, the last three years, I've qualified for Worlds. If I didn't, I'd probably just do one meet a year. Um, that really helps you with your social life. You're not always getting ready for a meet, like, going out of your mind, like, you know, and through the holidays and stuff, you don't have to worry about getting for getting ready for a meet. So, I mean, that's kind of what I discovered it, along the way is the less meets you do, the easier it is financially to keep with the sport, physically, so you don't beat yourself up. 
and mentally and just, you know, to manage your social life, you only have to worry about a couple meets a year. Stick to the big meets, stick to the important meets, and just make sure that your meet schedule is focused on your goals. So, just finished up training, got a post-workout meal and a pizza, but now this is the important stuff. Sunday after I train and eat, we come get all our groceries for the week. And we'll prep them tonight also. So we're here at Stop and Shop in Braintree, Massachusetts, and we're gonna go inside and pick up all our food for the week. We'll edit it out. So we're gonna go into the produce first. Usually I pick up some bananas and some greens, you know, just a little bit of greens, keep, keep systems in check. How many bananas do you think we need to eat? Six. Right. Yeah, a couple more. A few bananas, good carbs. Kale. Very hipster of me. Crossfit, paleo, whatever you want to call it, but I like it. It's like roto rooter in the stomach, you know what I'm saying? So I think it's important to eat some greens. With that. date on here. July 30th, yeah, solid. Get a bag of spinach also. We're gonna go just usually just shop on the outside. That's the key to grocery shopping. Don't shop on the inside aisles. That's where all the box mac and cheese, cereals, stuff like that. Stuff that Steve King likes. We stay on the outside. We're gonna get some chicken and beef. People are like, why is this kid getting videotape shopping? Because I'm 370 pounds, that's why. Prices progressed. You can buy a lot at once. That's cool. Grab like two four pound packages. Check the sell by date, $2.99 a pound. Pretty good deal, eight pounds of chicken. A little over 20 bucks. And we're gonna grab a couple pounds of ground beef. Almost three pounds of ground beef. Pretty solid. Now we're gonna go stand on the outside. We're gonna get some dairy, cottage cheese, yogurt, eggs, milk, all delicious stuff. This cottage cheese, I'll eat at night on like days I'm not at the gym. So if I come home from the gym on a weeknight, I'll eat like a chicken meal, but it'll be like 11 o'clock at night. But on an off night, I'll eat this before I go to bed. And one of these for the old lady. She likes it too, lactate brand. Packs of eggs, best one of the best ideas Stop and Shop ever had. These are regular, just large brown eggs, because Lola the dog likes eggs, so she eats a lot of these. I'm also gonna grab an 18 pack of Omega eggs. So I'll get these and Omega eggs. Last a long time, but eggs take a long time to go bad. So got 18 of these. Honestly, it's an 18 pack, so I'll run out by like Friday. So I'll eat four a day, but then I'll just start eating the regular eggs. So this pack looks good. Always check your eggs. Shout out Matt Buttimer for teaching me that in college. See this, see this game? This is the milk I've been drinking lately. This Coca-Cola milk, but it's actually really good and high in protein. It, it started at like 429 when it came out. Two for six, so we're getting two. That's a good deal. This stuff is awesome, try this milk. All right, I think we just, we're gonna venture into the inside aisles to get some bread and rice. You know, we, we make exceptions. All right, so just got back from the grocery store. Um, starting to prepare some of this food. Um, first thing I usually do since it takes the longest is I wash eight cups of uh, dry rice. Um, it's in here with water and a stick of butter. A stick of butter is eight tablespoons. Eight dry cups of rice. Rice roughly expands by two times, so it's about a half a tablespoon of butter per meal, because um, I eat a cup of rice uh, per meal a few times a day. So I'm gonna close this up and start the rice cooker. 
if you are prepping meals and you're eating rice, definitely get a rice cooker. It's pretty cheap and you just can't beat it. Cooking rice in a pot, it's pretty tough. So I got these big chicken breasts. So we're gonna do some power lifting right now, and we're gonna we're gonna slam them. Um, I buy the big like family packs of chicken, and the chicken breasts sometimes are pretty thick, and I want them to cook evenly. So good tip is to pound pound your chicken out. So I'm gonna do that real quick. Pulverize it, but it definitely helps even out the cooking and uh, tenderize the meat a little bit. Chicken breasts, you know. I'm sure everybody's dealt with this. It gets pretty tough sometimes if you don't cook it perfectly. And I'm gonna cook these at 350 degrees uh, for like a half hour and then finish them in the broiler. But it really helps tenderize meat also with some kind of acid. So I'm gonna add some lemon juice. Also add some good flavor. And I don't measure anything, as you can see. Um, I'm gonna add some olive oil flavor and a little bit of fat. We don't skip on skimp on the fat. Butter and oils very acceptable around here. Then you know chicken breast pretty plain. Um, trial and error base basically a lot of different recipes but this is the one I've been doing lately and I think I'm gonna keep doing it for a long time. Some onion powder. We have some garlic powder some hot red pepper. I like a little spice to all my food. Thyme. Uh, some parsley. I know it seems like a lot, but it's definitely worth it. Makes makes this stuff taste really good. So um, that's pretty much all I do. The chicken now. I just got to get in there with my hands and make sure that all the seasoning is spread evenly. Six. Oh, we should have got her. Huh? Eating. High five. Good girl. All right, so this is a finished product, cooked breast. I want to show what it looks like because I'm going to chop it up and weigh it out so my meals are consistent. Have a little food scale. Here's the ground beef. Just pretty simple. That's, you know, quick and easy. Um, got a bowl full of rice. Um, emptied that out of the rice cooker because I can also use it to steam vegetables so that's what I'm doing right now so then I'll be able to put everything together all right so pretty much done with fruit prep this actually isn't for the week this will last me like three or four days usually to the middle of Thursday um, then I might do a little smaller version of this Thursday but I it's because I, I really like like fresh food and that being said um, we packed everything in glass Tupperwares uh, Pyrex Tupperwares like these are the best investment I think we've ever made seven, seven or eight bucks for these, maybe like five or six bucks for these. Um, that's our dog Lola. Uh, for my meals, I have a cup of rice and that has the butter in it. Uh, I have some steamed kale, just a handful. I don't really measure the greens, but I eat them. And ten ounces of cooked chicken. So I roughly estimate that an ounce of cooked chicken, chicken breast, has seven grams of protein. So these meals are about. 70 grams of protein for me. Um, we have a few meals here for Danielle as well. She does a half cup of rice and uh, six ounces of cooked chicken with some spinach. So those are the chicken meals here. We have our dinners here for right now. After all this work, we're obviously going to eat. Um, then I have these ground beef meals. These are like 10 to 12 ounces of ground beef. Sometimes there's extra, so we put some extra in there. But same thing, cup of rice and some greens. Um, these I'll eat. Monday before the gym, Wednesday before the gym, and Friday before the gym. Sunday is a morning workout, so I eat eggs and stuff like that, but this would be my pre-workout meals. These would be lunch and dinner um, for the next few days. So, like tomorrow's Monday, I'm going to work out after, after work, so I'll get up in the morning, eat breakfast, eggs, English muffins, milk, stuff like that, um, a banana, a yogurt. Then lunchtime, I'll have one of these chicken meals. When I leave work, I'll have a beef meal, I'll work out at the gym, have a protein shake when, right when I'm done, and I'll come home and eat another chicken meal. So I don't know what that works out to, but that's how I've been doing it, and that's how I get the food I need to uh, squat big, bench big, and uh, pull big. So 
that's it. We're going to close these up. We're going to eat dinner and film, film some more later in the week. All right, it's Thursday, and I ran out of food from earlier in the week, so on the fly making three more meals to get through Friday. Um, here I have like a pound of chicken tenderloins. I chopped them up. Lime, cilantro, garlic, some hot pepper. Those are in a pan, olive oil. Over here, I got two bone-in beautiful pork chops. I mean, this stuff right here, I started doing this a while ago. These things are $3.99 a pound. They're a pound each. Um, can't get a better deal than that for a big juicy pork chop. At a restaurant, you pay 20 bucks for that. So, I mean, in a cast iron pan, I'm gonna brown them up and put them in the oven. To go with that, I got some nice boiled potatoes I already made. Burnt them a little bit, but I kind of like it that way. Some crispy, they're just potatoes cut in half. A little salt, pepper, and oil. Bake them and put them under the broiler, and that's how they come out. So after I pack these up, I'm going to show you what it looks like. I'm done cooking this stuff up. You can see I packed it up. Here's some chicken. Two potato halves, some spinach. It's a big juicy pork chop. Two halves of potato. Some spinach. Same thing on this plate I'm about to eat right now. Forgot to mention in the last video, these pork chops have salt, pepper, paprika, onion powder, and rosemary on them. Really good recipe. Um, you know, pork is a good source of protein, and these pork chops are pretty lean. Not all pork is bacon, so maybe you guys can try this out. Um, this whole week, well, this whole month, I've been pretty much squatting with lighter weights, but been doing this week specifically uh, lots of volume even though the weight and the sets and reps change the work sets are always totaling 15,000 pounds of volume so at four times a week I'm doing 60,000 pounds of volume this week uh, next week I'm gonna up it a little bit so just kind of getting my conditioning being being pretty far out on my next meet get my conditioning under me for squat um, since I am doing so much volume on the squat and turn I'm pulling light twice a week, snatch grip pulls and deficit deadlifts. And then tonight, once a week, I'll pull pretty heavy, but it's not a lot of work, you know, work up to some heavy doubles. Um, it definitely hurts the hamstrings and stuff and your back after squatting, you know, 10 sets. But that's the plan right now. Eventually, I'm going to flip that, work in some more deadlift volume and get my body ready to squat some heavier weights and drop volume off on the squat and up the intensity. You know, I kind of like to plan it so one's complementing the other or I'm doing different stuff because it's, it's hard to train both concurrently. Um, the bench is definitely, I keep that separate from my squat and deadlift training, how I plan that. The bench, I just try to do a lot of volume straight through all different exercises, dumbbells, incline bench, board bench, uh, close grip bench. So I do those a lot and a lot of heavy back work. So. That's pretty much the plan right now. Uh, I want to explain a little bit more why I started with such light squats uh, after nationals this year in May. I had a really good total. I felt really good. And uh, my back started bothering me right away. I was actually hurt my back front squatting when I got back from that trip. And uh, I decided to switch my shoes to flat shoes. So. It, it kind of works out that I'm trying to get conditioned for the squat using light weights and also getting used to wearing flat shoes because I think in heels I was kind of rounding my lower back and, and putting my lower back in a kind of dangerous position and kind of liking how the flats feel so far. So when I get to heavier weights, I'm definitely going to see how that goes. Also, I tend to strain, train with straps on the deadlifts. I just want to explain why I do that because I like to stay symmetrical when I pull. When I flip my hand over, and I do that for a long time, like three or four weeks in a row, pulling heavy with my hand flipped over, my, my, the side of my underhand, my lower back just kills. So when I'm pretty far out of the meat, I pull with straps. Uh, I'll fix that later. But I do a lot of double overhand work when I do my lighter pulls and try to keep my grip strong. And I really don't have an issue with that, at least so far. So that's pretty much the methodology with what I'm doing right now. That being said, I'm 15 weeks out of my next meet, and that's going to be IPF equipped world. Uh, 
it's in Luxembourg this year and pretty excited for that trip pretty excited to get get on the platform with some really crazy competition gonna be with a fellow USAPL super heavyweight superstar lifter Blaine Sumner really excited to compete alongside him instead of against him and uh, obviously Carl Christensen from Norway will be there last year's world champion supposedly Konovalov is coming back to the Russian he's the 2013 world champion and then I think David Lupak from Czech Republic is it Czech Republic now he's coming for his first opens uh, he won juniors in 2014 so I mean it's just gonna be full of great lifters um, the European champion uh, Svistanov from Ukraine so it's gonna be crazy I honestly don't know where I'm gonna fall but <laughs> I know it's gonna be the toughest meet of my life so I'm training really hard for that uh, two years ago 2013 I managed to place fourth at my first opens which I was really excited about uh, good performance went eight for nine and hit some PRs and you know jumped a guy on my last deadlift for fourth and I was really excited about that. Last year I was pretty poised to take the silver. Unfortunately I had some issues with my bench shirt um, and wasn't able to complete the meet. I got a couple, uh, I got a squat medal and a deadlift medal which are my first IPF medal so still I try to take the positive out of that experience but definitely looking forward to this year to try and get on the podium because I'm feeling like the last two years I was close being fourth and then you know having second kind of in my sight and then slipped out from under the rug so I'm so excited for this year and um, that's that's what I'm planning for with my training so hey Rick Johnson yes sir how long you been lifting the barbell uh, 38 years 38 years yep. is that a lie too or is that is that for real it's compared to what what's your snatch grip deadlift PR 965. Wait, wait, what's your snatch grip deadlift PR? Nine. So Rick's is 905. 905. <laughs> really? Yeah. It is? For five. Awesome. <laughs> on the That's, That's a good exercise. How old is that t shirt? Demo oh, 92? You ain't lying. That's about 30 years old. <laughs> this is Capolino, Cam. Come on, man. Michi, don't grind. Good. Come on. Go. More speed. Tight. Get up. Come on. Come on. Good. Oh, my God. Peach, so you tell me your carryover is two reds a side? Yeah, I could squat probably 660 right now in gear. We don't do carryover percentage. We do. By reds. Yeah, by reds. How many reds you got? How many reds you got? Probably with a suit? About two reds and a green. Two reds and two and a half reds. Yeah, Good. Two and a half reds. All right. So, like I was saying, this is my third year in a row at IPF Worlds, Open Worlds, and it's taken a lot to get to this level um, for me. When I started, um, <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. Um, so. I want to kind of look back on that and try to give some advice to younger lifters. When I started, I basically was a collegiate lifter and all I could think about was winning collegiate nationals. And I was the first kind of person in my area or at my school in, in, in the whole kind of area to start doing like national USAPL meets. Um, so I didn't know anybody who was doing these types of meets. I didn't seek out anybody to really help me out. Um, the people that were helping me were helping me like a lot but they also didn't have the experience um, to coach at national meets and and plan training for a, a, a national lifter so I went through a lot like bombing out of a lot of meets when I was a young lifter I bombed out I flew to uh, junior worlds when I was 23 it was actually like five or six years into my lifting career but I still didn't have any IPF experience or no one at home where I was training to tell me what it was going to be like and it ended up being a bad experience. I bombed on the squats, not knowing that IPF depth was going to be an issue or, you know, traveling to these meets was going to be an issue. Um, so my advice to younger lifters would be to seek out someone who knows what they're doing, and especially if they have experience at USAPL or IPF meets, because when I look back on my, the last eight years of powerlifting for me, 
I wish that I had someone to tell me like, you know, you could win collegiate nationals, which I ended up doing. It took me three years to get my first one, and then I ended up winning two. But find someone who can say, yeah, you can win collegiate nationals, that's great, but your aim should be to get on the national team as a junior or a sub-junior or whatever. I skipped, I got invited to two junior worlds that I just declined because I had no one to say, like, this is the end goal, this is what you want to do. Um, so I feel like as a young lifter starting out, you need to find somebody who, who knows their stuff. Um, also another piece of advice and what helped me a lot is to find like a, someone you look up to, not necessarily a mentor that's with you, but like a role model. And you know, I'm, I'm sponsored by Quest now and Sherman Ledford, owner of Quest Nutrition, does a ton for me. I fly down there to Atlanta when I can, train with him and some of the, and James Townsend, a world team coach in Atlanta. Um, I watched all the Quest lifters back in the day, Wade Hooper, Brian Siders, Mike Teixeira, Caleb Williams. Those guys, I watched their technique, I watched their, the way they lifted, their attempt selection, um, tried to look at their training, tried to figure out how they became so explosive, and I was just obsessed with it. And I think that helped me a lot, because I looked up to specifically Brian Siders, and just that's what I was chasing, a thousand pound squat, 800 pound bench. I mean, I'm still not there yet, but I still think about that every day. And I was trying to emulate him, but I didn't even know how to start. And years later, now I know how to squat like him and bench like him and actually met the guy, Sherman, who trained him for a long time. So that definitely kept me motivated for a long time. And I think my last piece for last piece of advice for younger lifters would be to not focus on one lift. If you're young, don't become a bench specialist or a deadlift specialist. Let it come naturally. You know, if you're if you're Ian Bell and you can just you're a deadlift prodigy, you know, roll with it. But don't focus 70% of your training on one lift. Focus on the total. Don't chase American records. Let them come to you. And just, just chase a bigger total. Set modest goals that you can hit. Discuss your goals with other people so they can tell you if they're realistic. And, uh, you know, just, just stay consistent with all three lifts. And no, don't think about anything except for pulling that shit. We got young Steve King here. Yeah. Train for that Young Worlds. Let's go! Young Worlds training. Put it! Oh, hit through! Yeah. Oh, nice. Hey, Steve King, what kind of deadlift suit you wearing? The new Inzer Fusion. That's not new. That's good. Oh, it's America. All right, so pretty sure this is going to be the end of the video. I filmed a lot of stuff over the last, like, 10 days. Um, hopefully it gives everybody a good insight to what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, how I train, how I eat. Um, one thing I forgot to mention when I was talking about IPF lifting, I just wanted to specifically address why I lift single ply equipped, and it's not really because I don't like raw. Um, it's not really, well, I'm not good at raw, let's be honest. But, <laughs> <laughs> but when I started powerlifting in 2007, um, the, the guys lifting in the USAPL, I was looking at Brian Siders, Wade Hooper, Caleb Williams, um, Tony Harris, all these like Brad Gillingham, mm -hmm. huge Brad Gillingham fan. Um, I just always had a passion for it. I love the feeling. It's kind of like that dangerous feeling. Really get like a nervous feeling like you're going to puke when you go out for a big squat. You know, you just get, it's just, it's just an adrenaline on another level and that's what I crave and what keeps me motivated to keep competing. So. I mean, just based on how I started in the sport, who I looked up to, and just the the rush that I'm kind of chasing and competing and still chasing, you know, that IPF Open Worlds thing. I, I don't want to, just want to address that, you know, because I know everybody's talking about raw gear, raw gear. You know, if you started lifting before 2009, there was no raw division. So if you wanted to compete and win, you got gear. Maybe one day I'll switch, but for now, I'm going to keep it with Equip. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, thank you, USAPL, for the opportunity, and thanks to everyone here at Bay State, Lele, Danielle, Peach, King, for helping me video this stuff, and thank you, Ryan, for editing it. I know it's going to be awesome, so see you guys at a meet soon.